It's time for Pet Files Ask the Vet, underwritten by the Millers and Veterinary Practice. Traditional small animal medicine and surgery, chiropractic, laser therapy, acupuncture, and Chinese herbal medicine, 518-789-3440, millersonvet.com. With us today, Dr. Carolyn Cannon, owner and chief vet at the Millerton Veterinary Practice. We love this show. Hello, Dr. Cannon. Hello, and good morning, Joe Goodman. You are going to answer a question. I feel like I'm running a game show. For Jaden in Poughkeepsie. (laughs) Jaden, would you sign in, please? Okay. My girlfriend and I found a kitten last month. We figure he's just a couple of months old because he's not spraying yet, thank God. Anyway, he's super energetic and happy, but he looks skinny and bony no matter how much he eats. Eating is his favorite thing, and he purrs the whole time and gobbles his food so fast it's over in two seconds. If we let him, he'd eat a whole can at a time, but he still looks skinny. Okay. So the, I think the question is maybe why is he looking so thin and eating so much? And so eight-week-old you know, two-month-old kitties do tend to eat a lot of food, depending on what you're feeding. Um, if you're feeding a dry food, they they usually don't need as much because the calories are so concentrated. So you want to make sure that you have um, that you're feeding a kitten food. Number one. I prefer to introduce them more to canned food than dry, which means it's a lot of food. Really, it looks like a, it looks like a whole lot of food, but they're growing very rapidly during that phase. And then you want to make sure that he doesn't have parasites. So, if we have a kitten who has parasites, they do tend to uh, they do tend to grow slower because the, the parasites will suck a lot of the nutrients from the from the gut, um, and they uh, will be very hungry, and their coats might not look so shiny. Um, but that's not always the case. You can have a, a kitten with a lot of roundworms who might look just fine to you. So make sure you get that kitty to the vet and bring a stool sample with you, a fairly fresh one, to see if we've got parasites going on. And also to have that discussion about how much are you actually feeding um, that it may maybe that you're not overfeeding, maybe you're not feeding frequently enough, um, Maybe there's something else going on. So hopefully the kitty has um, form stools because if there's loose stool, of course, that can take away a lot of nutrition as well. Um, so first thing I always check for, and even if we don't find them, sometimes I'll go ahead and deworm if you've got a kitten who's doing a lot of eating and hungry all the time. But they do look slim. We're used to looking at big, fat cats. <laughs> we really are. Everybody thinks that their cat is fine and they're overweight. So, you know, if you have a cat normal weight, they look really slim. If he's bony, though, and you can feel the spinous processes on the top of his back and um, feel all of his ribs, then clearly he's underweight and we need to do something about that. Yeah, and as someone who has just recently um, gone through an older but still absolutely ravenous cat that I'm feeding only um, wet food to, I'm noticing that, I mean, there are times when he just, if, if, if given the opportunity, the guy could, go, I mean, he could, he, he could literally eat a horse. Yes, yes, and they always think that they're hungry, yeah. Yeah, what's with that? Mine will jump uh, if given the opportunity if I'm not looking, we'll jump onto a plate and steal a big piece of broccoli and chew that. doesn't matter what it is. At least yours is a vegetarian. Mine has eaten Italian sausage. Mine, my, mine, has, um, <laughs> t- mine has carted off things. What, what are those? Oh, yeah, piranha. He, he, he's good the size differential, literally. He could take a cow leg if, if given <laughs> right. if I turned my back. Sometimes yeah. the only good news is that things make such you know, a clatter uh, an old trick I learned from um, a nice lady on the Lower East Side about where to hide your cash. Just stick it in the pots and pans because you'll hear it if somebody's trying to take it. Um, but but you can he, every so often he miscalculates the weight and the ensuing noise is enough to give him away. But uh, mm-hmm. um, I, do, I, I kind of don't know what to – when I say don't know what to do, my, the only reason I'm really raising it is because I, I would prefer to not give him dry – Mm-hmm. But sometimes I don't know how to make him, I, I, so I'm not. But sometimes, you know, is there any other trick to making them not hungry, or is it just the, the really. cat mind control thing? Yeah, they want to be. They want to be big, fat. Yeah, 
yeah, little and, little bowling yeah. balls. Okay, and and they're and they're not spending their time doing other things. You know, they would be hunting much of the day. So, uh, if they're not going to be able to hunt, uh, then what do, what else are you going to do aside from sitting there thinking about food, begging for food, stealing food? It's all about food. I got you. Uh, my mine is actually he is hunting. He's just working his way through the house systematically, destroying things, which is where uh-huh. where we've. Uh, it seems as though we've come full circle. All right, so that's that. So they need to be entertained, they, but there's no kitty daycare. There's no. Pe- I mean, people don't really. I know. Focus. I know. I tell you, I have invisible fence for my cats, and I love it. I have the invisible fence brand, um, and they have helped me to train my cats to it, and so they can go outdoors while we're here. We only let them out when we're here, or if we have one of the dogs out. Um, and they spend so much time chasing each other and climbing up the little trees and onto the rocks, and it um, it makes them um, not not beg for food <laughs> 24 hours a day, and they seem to have a wonderful time chasing butterflies and all of that. All right. Well, I don't know if that's going to work, but... <laughs> It's, it is very time-consuming. We trained them in the house first to keep them out of the kitchen because they are both thieves. And so if you train them in the house, then, of course, you've got your flags up on the tape to the floor in the kitchen. And then they, um, they have to wear a collar. And when they hear the beep, 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 they go the other way. So they learned that in the house. And so outdoors it was easier to train them. So right. just, a, just a plug for Invisible Fence. Bound, think... Boundaries for Pets in Lakeville did a great job. That sounds like a really interesting idea. As I said, the blind spaniel is going to be really entertained by that. All right. right. Moving to Andrew and Doty in Clarksville, Tennessee. We just moved to Tennessee, and it turns out that snakes in the backyard is a big part of life here. According to our new next-door neighbors, some of them are poisonous, like cottonmouths and rattlesnakes. Yikes! As if that wasn't enough to worry about, we have a cat and a dog that are used to lounging in the yard, and we're terrified that one of them is going to get bitten. Can you please talk about what to do in case of snake bite? Is there something I can keep in the house in case of a bite, or something we can do before we get to the vet? You, for I, I can't speak to to a cottonmouth. I don't know that much about them, but r- rattlesnakes are are around here. Um, although rattlesnake bite is rare. Um, then what the general thing that you're supposed to do is not get your dog ra- uh, riled up. So you don't want that heart to be pounding and blood flowing and um, pushing the venom around their their bodies. So the best you can do to stay calm and don't let your dog run around. You might even, if, if it's small enough, lift it up and put it in the car and then you want to go to an emergency clinic because I would even call and ask them if they have antivenin because your regular veterinarian is not going to have, 99% of the time, is not going to have rattlesnake venom. And even if, if it's an emergency clinic, they might not have it, but they might have access to it from a hospital if your dog needs it. So they may just need supportive care at the hospital like intravenous fluids um, et cetera, but you're going to want to definitely go to your closest emergency clinic. So you can, if you can get a, um, you know, on your cell, if you can talk on your cell while you're driving, that's the best way to do it. Um, figure out, you should know ahead where your closest emergency clinic is. And um, you might even want to ask ahead, if you're in a rattlesnake area, ask ahead whether they have the venom on hand is down it- south. Is it the same? For, you would ask the same question, uh, question for cottonmouths as well. I mean, you yes, basically. Yeah, I would definitely just, find out about it. I yeah. don't know. I don't know about it, but but the principle is that you don't want to get anybody riled up. So, uh, you know, as calmly as possible, get to the vet and um, for the care that they need, a lot of supportive care to support the the blood pressure, et cetera. And um, and to get some antivenin in, it goes in through the IV fluids, and to take some care of that bite too. So the skin and the tissue around the bite can become necrotic; it can die uh, die off uh, locally over time. So you want to get that cleaned up really well, clipped hair clipped, cleaned up, and um, you'll get specific instructions on how to watch that over time. And then um, it's really keeping your dog, once it's discharged, keeping your dog very quiet. So I think it's a great thing to plan for. If you've really planned well, you, it'll probably never happen. 
Sounds like uh, the way I'd like uh, to deal with snake bites. All right, Felicity in Plainfield. I have a six-month-old male intact Great Dane. I know that large dogs are prone to heart problems, and I want to know if there's anything I can do to preserve his heart health as much as possible. I'm open to alternative treatments. Great Danes in particular can be prone to heart disease. Uh, So this is a great question. Um, If your puppy has a family history of heart disease, then the recommendation would be to start really screening for heart disease. They get dilated cardiomyopathy. And um, that means that the heart muscle will get, the heart muscle will thin and get flabby over time. And so it won't work as well as it should. Um, It is not, you know, it is a genetic disease, so it's poorly understood about exactly what it is that causes it. So it's hard to talk about supplements, et cetera. But certainly the standard process cardiac support is something that I, as a supplement, a whole food supplement that I really like. I wouldn't start that as a puppy. I would say if you, if there's a family history, maybe at about three years old, you want to, you might want to talk to your veterinary about starting the, the uh, cardiac support and um, doing an echo to screen for cardiomyopathy. I think if there isn't any family history, then that's probably not necessary. Although, if you're if you're someone who's going to be worried about it, you might want to just go ahead and get a baseline echocardiogram. And there's a blood test called a cardi- cardiac troponin one test to see if that's elevated at all, which can indicate, that test indicates stretch of the myocardium, which is the heart muscle. Um, Just for a baseline wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, You know, so screening for this is is important because you want to catch it early, as early as possible, so that you can um, prolong life. But unfortunately, there isn't any sort of magical thing that I can say like, oh, supplement with taurine and then you won't get it. Um, su- supplement with coenzyme Q10, you know, those things are probably not needed if your pup will never get heart disease. Um, and, and when does it usually kick up? It's understandable to have a baseline. It's also, I uh, come from a long line of being told that, I don't know, you have XYZ and you spend so much time looking for it that you finally develop it. No, I, I, I don't literally yeah, mean that, but yeah. what, what I mean is you spend so much time focused on that, and if it's going to happen, that you miss a bunch of other stuff, including And there the are other things, yeah. right, with Great Danes, such as um, wobblers right. disease, you know, with their cervical, yeah, cervical spine. So you want to watch all of those things. You want to be somewhat careful about these Dane puppies that can go crazy, and, you know, mine used to jump. Uh, he wasn't even a puppy. It was two, and he would, his toy, <laughs> if we... His toy one day was up in the tree, and he was literally jumping, you know, four feet off the ground trying to grab it when we caught him, <laughs> when we caught him doing that. So you have to be careful. They're, they're built like a dinosaurs, you know. They're just hugely boned, and so they can much more, the, there's too much bone for the amount of muscle, and so they can easily hurt themselves. So you want to sort of have controlled activity as best you can and, um, you know, try not to worry too much about it. But I, I don't think it's unreasonable to start thinking about dilated cardiomyopathy when they're about three years old and make sure that your veterinarian is, um, is watching for signs of, uh, you know, of a problem, uh, listening for an abnormal heartbeat. And is there any uh, particular uh, diet that you recommend? I do know that solid gold was created by a woman in Germany who had Danes, and she couldn't. And and she, def- I I don't know. Uh, I'm sh- this was years yeah, and years ago, yeah. but this diet well, was specifically, and it extended their life considerably. But I don't know, you know, if that applies to other pets, and I don't know how things have changed since then. But yeah, you know, unfortunately, the the difference. So we we have the Great Dane, we have the um, Doberman Pinscher. We have the boxer. They all have potential to have heart disease, but they have sort of different types. And and the um, genetics may be similar with the 
stain and the and the and the dobe, but unfortunately, we don't really fully understand. We can't say it's because they're they've got this extra gene or they're lacking this gene that that helps to transform, you know, this type of taurine into that that's usable. We just don't know enough about it. And so, being on a generally on a really good diet, that's not going to have your dog grow too fast when they're a Great Dane. Um, so, solid gold is a good idea. Abadie is a good diet. Um, we have to be a little bit more careful about the grain, quote unquote, grain free diets that add lentils and um, peas. A lot of lentils and peas that are high up on the list of ingredients. It's just, um, it is a mishmash of what do you do? Right. Um, right. So, feeding, generally, a feeding a good diet that's well rounded. And I always advocate for a little bit of fresh vegetable material and some. Um, Fresh fruit, you know, especially the berries, so organic blueberries I give my guys and uh, some really fresh greens. Put a, put a big handful in the blender with a little bit of bone broth because they can't break down the cell wall. Dogs can't, so you need to blend it. Um, fill up your little ice cube trays with, uh, with the, the stuff and... Thaw them out, you know, the night before for the next for the morning feeding, and and th- during the day for the nighttime feeding, feed a little bit of extra fresh vegetables. You want to round out your nutrients as much as possible. And a quick a quick digression, uh, just to check in on the grain free issue, grain free slash cardiomyopathy issue. Is yeah. there any uh, is there any further development along the? Uh, Nothing that I'm aware of that's definitive at this point. But still something to be aware of when you are grain-freeing your yes. critters. Yeah, so if you, especially if you, have a, uh, you know, if you have a dog who's prone to heart disease to begin with, yes, something to be aware of. And is that, is that usually, do you, do you get that at Vet 101 when you walk in? It, 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 most veterinarians are like, hi, here's my little golden retriever puppy. Um, do they? T- do you have to ask, or is that something that's that's told? We well, we ask about what they're feeding, and then from there we go on. And yeah. would you say that most? I mean, is that is that something that has uh, become more of a? Uh, uh, yeah, v- very few people are are feeding the grain free, and and I think it's probably in a, in a way it's a good thing. The early on, you know, years and years ago, if you fed a grain free, it was because they put more meat in it. But then they, uh, all of the companies figured they could write grain-free on the label and fill it with potato starch or tapioca starch, which isn't a grain, but it is a starch. <laughs> exactly. So it's very difficult to navigate oh, what it's to like, feed your dogs. It's now. like organic in the organic lobby. You know, it's like, okay, it's fine. It could be 90, you know, 90x percent organic. That's, but what about that other 4% or 6%? Yeah, you know, that's, right, that's the right. story. So that's the story of life. Quickly feel how to uh, find out, figure out how to get around things. Oh yeah, laws and yeah. Oh yeah, and then and, but common sense enters into it when you're talking about diets. You know, we go back to that's that's something that you've traditionally just gone back to. Is like just just be intelligent. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with some grains, and you know, dogs are not obligate carnivores, so there's nothing wrong with some grains. Cats can eat grain free diets, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with some grains in dogs, and the growing dogs absolutely need some. Um, you know, but we don't we need to, unless your dog has a really serious chronic condition, such as chronic inflammation or especially skin disease. And so you don't really need to worry about that too much. As long as you look at your ingredients and you've got a good amount of, of meat protein, you don't want to see, uh, you know, in my opinion, corn gluten meal as your first ingredient. What about, um, uh, uh, like, chicken pieces and then that's okay i mean chicken meal so the interesting thing is if you have chicken as your first ingredient is okay but you want to have a a meat meal if you're feeding dry food you want to have a meat meal after that because the because of the amount of water that's actually in the chicken so you can say oh well the chicken weighs this much and i can put it as my first ingredient but actually all the water is coming out of it and so you're not getting that much chicken so if you have a meat meal so Beef meal, chicken meal, um, byproduct meal is is okay, but you know you don't want necessarily all the byproducts. I don't think you're getting enough meat that way. Right. So if you're looking at, you know, chicken's your first ingredient, fresh fresh whole chicken, and then lamb meal is your second ingredient. That's okay. Perfect. 
Very good advice. All right, we're moving to Jay in Brooklyn. I have a healthy, active five-year-old cowboy corgi, which is a corgi cattle dog mix that I've had since she was a puppy. For the past couple of years, she has been very prone to tripping over her front legs. She'll be chasing a ball and suddenly wipe out. It happens even when she's not going especially fast. Although she limps slightly and is slow for the rest of the day, the limp clears up. Afterwards, sorry, she limps slightly and is slow for the rest of the day. The limp clears up when I apply a hot compress to her shoulders, but I'm somewhat concerned there's a musculoskeletal issue that I need to be watching for. So I'm not sure if I missed it or not, but it doesn't say a particular leg, I think. The question was not... Um, tripping, so, you know, just tripping over her front just, legs. Yeah, so both legs. Yeah. So, um, so the number one first thing I would do is make sure those toenails aren't too long, because that can be a real issue. So if the toenails are fine, then what we're looking at is, you know, do we have actual lameness on one side or the other? And it's a little suspicious to me that there might be a, a caudal cervical problem, so spine, neck spine. Um, but that's something that we, needs to be looked for. So a physical exam that's going to examine neck and shoulders and um, adduct and abduct to the shoulders, so the um, particular particular musculoskeletal exam to see if there is a problem with uh, muscle loss around the shoulders. Maybe there's some biceps tendonitis there, which is, gets better with rest. Um, maybe there's some osteoarthritis in the shoulders. Maybe there's a cervical, caudal cervical. The cervical spine is the neck spine. Okay. And um, all the way back before you get to the ribs, there can be disc disease there. I mean, there can be disc disease anywhere, but it can be manifesting in the, in the um, front legs because the nerve roots come out to the front legs in the caudal cervical spine. So would the so, first, would you start with a regular vet for x-rays or would you go to... Absolutely, yeah. A regular a vet for a good exam and then for good x-rays. Okay, and then possibly a chiropractor, possibly a... Yeah, so if if your vet is not finding any pain or any indication that it would be a neck problem, um, but, you know, maybe a shoulder problem, but the shoulders look clean on x-ray, then check with a chiropractor. And that would be the be, next. That would be the next, that, that, that would be the next thing before running off. Yeah, with, a vet, with an animal chiropractor. Yeah, mm-hmm. because it, it does, in, I don't know, I'm curious, the limp clears up when I apply a hot compress to her shoulders. Yeah, yeah. that's. Just, just, I mean, it could could be anything. Okay, it, it, it's hard. Yeah, it could be the muscles. You know, so those those neck muscles um, are right in the vicinity of the shoulders. Lots of people don't know the difference between a shoulder joint and a shoulder blade. So I guess I have to take all that with a grain of salt. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It took me how long did it take you to teach me? Long, long time. to take things with a grain of salt. No, no, that that oh. that that I had to teach you. Uh, but no, the difference between a shoulder blade and a shoulder. <laughs> right. Yeah, and yeah. a shoulder joint. Yeah. So right, and and there can be lots of things going on with those shoulder joints, and sometimes it's difficult. Often it's difficult to tell whether there's any muscle loss, meaning that they've been favoring the joint, or maybe they're walking on the outsides of their toes or the insides of their toes, and so the muscles on one side or the other would be a little bit. Um, either atrophied or just a less tone there. So there are subtle differences. And um, depending on how corgi-ish this dog is, it can be difficult to get good x-rays too. Is What I mean is, you know, the short right. um, uh, brachycephalic kind of... Um, the- chondro- chondrodystrophic is the name for it, for the breeds that are short. They have all of this bone in this little tiny leg, and so they can be difficult to get good radiographs and sometimes often need sedation. All right, and then right, just quickly, the, the, the toenail thing was interesting too, so that's probably something. That's the... Yeah, it's, it's amazing how they can affect how your dog moves and how if the, toes, if the front toenails are so long that the toes are being lifted off the ground, it's going to throw off all of the balance and proprioception that all of these little nerve endings that are in the, the toes, they're not going to hit the ground anymore. And so, you know, your dog's feeling of where it is, where he or she is in space, um, isn't there anymore. And so you get some tripping and um, 
repeatedly, and actually there can be strain on the neck as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Cannon. Thank you. This My has, pleasure. This has been Pet Files Ask the Vet, underwritten by the Millerton Veterinary Practice, 518-789-3440, millertonvet.com. Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who?